Welcome again to Authors and Innovators. I'm really thrilled um, that our next author is also an innovator. Sarah Fry is an American farmer and business owner. She's the CEO of Fry Farm, the largest grower of pumpkins in the United States. What's really interesting and fascinating about her new book, The Growing Season, How I Saved an American Farm and Built a New Life, is that Sarah was raised on a small 100-acre farm in southern Illinois, where at age eight, she and her mom would sell, sell and buy watermelons from local farmers and go store to store making deliveries during the summer. At age 17, with her dad ill, she secured a loan and bought the family business. As her business continued to grow, Sarah's other brothers uh, returned home to work with her, uh, where they remain today. Uh, and today, the company, Frey Farms, has um, growing operations in seven states, uh, and they uh, are one of the biggest uh, suppliers of pumpkins, watermelons, cantaloupes, sweet corn, winter squash, uh, and other fall ornamentals in the United States. Uh, Sarah is also uh, an innovator, and we're going to talk a little bit about her latest um, idea, summer watermelon juice. Sarah serves on a variety of industry boards and has a national reputation. And I'm so pleased to welcome Sarah Fry to talk about her new book, The Growing Season. Welcome, Sarah. So, Sarah, this book, um, it was just terrific. Uh, and, and, and I wrote about this in, in my column in the Boston Business Journal. It's, it's a memoir, but it's also um, a, a story about building a new independent entrepreneurial life. So let's start a bit at the beginning. Sarah, uh, this is one of the, uh, it's, it's so fascinating. You are one of the youngest of 21 children. Your parents combined 21 children, and you grew up in this farm in, in, in southern Illinois. What was your life like back then? Well, it was kind of like it is now. It was actually very isolated. So, you know, um, what's really ironic about uh, the time in which we find ourselves in now uh, as a country is that it's, it, for me, it's very similar to how I grew up as a child. Um, so I grew up on uh, the small farm, 80 acres. I grew up in a home with my four older brothers from my parents' um, marriage. And so they each had children from previous marriages that were much older than us. And so I grew up as the only girl in the household, um, besides my mother with these four older brothers, in Southern Illinois in a very rural, isolated part of the country and with dreams of escaping this life, uh, you know, through really my, my, my entire childhood, I've dreamed of, you know, the day that I would get off of the farm. And, you know, what's really ironic about the time we find ourselves in today is that this place that I spent so much of my time dreaming to escape is now the escape. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, like, it, it's yeah. so crazy because, you know, everyone is looking to get out of the cities and, you know, get out to a more rural lifestyle and sort of to, to get away from, from, from people and being, you know, stacked on top of each other. And I, um, for me, it, it was just, there's so much irony in this year, but it was, um, outside of, uh, those feelings of knowing that there was a bigger world out there. And I felt like there were, there were more things awaiting me after I get, got off of the farm. Um, there were also really great memories being made here on the farm with my four older brothers. So, you know, as the youngest and the only girl, oftentimes I would be left behind when they would go do, you know, fun boy stuff like, hey, we're going to go hunt now for dinner or, you know, we're going on this very dangerous adventure, but no, you can't go, you know. So when I was a really little, I spent the majority of my time just being really, you know, sort of upset that the boys were leaving me behind. So when I was, you know, if they finally started taking me along when I was like five or six years old and, you know, on a few of the, of the adventures on the few of the more, you know, sort of their safer adventures. And then I tell the story of, you know, shooting uh, my, my first rabbit, first rabbit. And, yeah. and the book, but, you know, I really didn't shoot the rabbit. We find out that, um, <laughs> you know, later on they tell me, no, we just wanted to build your confidence. You know, the, we had already shot the rabbit and we propped it up in the bush and we, we let you believe that you were the greatest hunter in the world, you know, when you went with us. So, um, 
you know, my life was full of adventures growing up on the farm. There's some difficult things as well that I share in the book, things that I, uh, very difficult things that I went through um, as a child. But uh, for the most part, the memories here uh, are of close family bonds and growing up, uh, ultimately, you know, working together. And that was what led me to make that decision later on when I was a teenager um, that I would that I was going to stay behind instead of, you know, follow after my brothers who had all left the farm. So it was it was those family bonds and that closeness that made me come to the realization that um, I wanted to create and build a life that would allow us to all be back together again, working together um, like we had when we were children. And my fear in that moment was that if I left, we wouldn't have anything to come home to. I love how you infuse so much of the early part of the book, which makes it really engaging. You talk about your family, the good, the bad, the candid. Tell me about more, tell our, tell our viewers more about your mom and dad, both of which unique people, um, but entrepreneurs in yeah. both cases. Talk yeah. a little bit about your mom and your dad and their entrepreneurial influence on you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my father had, you know, this big racehorse dream and um, that's, it's the horse racing industry isn't called the sport of kings for for nothing. I mean, you really <laughs> have to be a king. You, you have to have a lot of money to, to really be successful on that. But we had, um, you know, we had horses on this farm, thoroughbreds, um, and it was, it was more of a breeding farm, but he had this, like this dream and this passion that really sort of, you know, uh, over, over, like it came before anything else. It, you know, at times it came before his family. And I think so many, um, so many times, um, you hear this with entrepreneurs are really wildly successful people who have started companies, you know, that like they become, they have, they, it becomes an obsession and then everything else sort of falls to the wayside. And then when at the end of their life, they they, they look back and they reflect, was all of that really that important? Did I, what did I do with my time here? And I watched my father really kind of go through that uh, as a young girl. And I watched him, you know, and it wasn't just with the horses, um, you know, he actually was in, in some respects, a, a good and fair businessman in some, in some of his dealings. But then there were times when I saw him, you know, I, I watched him sort of like, hustle and, and, you know, spin and, and do things that really weren't that straightforward. So I, he was a promoter. He was, he he was. And, um, so for me, you know, as a little kid, like I had a front row seat to all of that. And then I watched my mother in the summers work so hard. I mean, she worked hard year round, but I watched her, you know, get in that truck every morning I'd get in with her and we would go out and we would, you know, go from the farm to, you know, load the melons to store to store to store. And I watched just how her, her style was very different than his. Her style was very straightforward, very matter of fact. And she didn't, she didn't really have that um, sort of real like salesy, you know, trying to upsell somebody. It was more like, do you want the melons or not? It's hot outside. If you don't want any, I got to go because, you know, it's hot in the back of the truck. They're great today. And that's where I think I really helped her as a little kid because I had more of an, I loved people. And so getting off of the farm, um, you know, with, to go with her on the melon route was the most exciting part of my life. I mean, I looked forward to these summers when I would actually get in that truck. If she would leave me, I would be chasing the truck down the road. Like, no, no, wait, I'm going with you. So, um, you know, and just watching, you know, she had, and still has to this day, it's really incredible. My, my mother's, uh, she'll be 80 this year and she still has a melon route. She delivers melons Wow! and we can't wow. stop her. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> so, um, she yeah. just has an incredible work ethic and, um, you know, she was, she was about get the job done, complete the task. And, um, so I was able to, you know, I, I sort of got, I felt like, seeing all of that with my parents, you know, both the, 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 what to do, what maybe what not to do really sort of shaped me as, as a child. And because I started 
learning all of that so young, that's how I think. And then, you know, combined with all of the experiences that I had here on the farm, observing my parents, the experiences I had on the farm, both good and bad, really sort of shaped me into the, you know, young woman that I would later become. And were I tell all of those stories in the growing season, because it was really the foundation for you know, how I was able to take risks, take a stand, and have the confidence to pursue a dream at such an early age. And so you uh, uh, you, you take this from the book. Um, I did. Uh, it's so engaging and so entertaining. You're very much a blend of those entrepreneurial styles. As you said, your dad's a promoter, your mom's no nonsense. We've got to get this done. Yeah. So, Let's take our viewers, and, and you talk about this, and I want them all to um, enjoy this piece of the book, because I did. You get to a point where you say to your dad, look, we're going to lose this, but I'm not going to let that happen. We're doing this. I'm going to buy this. Right. Talk about that as a 17-year-old right. young entrepreneur. Right. Um, you just said, I'm, I'm going to do this. Well, I, there was so much that had happened to get me to that point. I mean, the farm, we were always in fear of losing the farm. It was, right. it was, you know, every six months or every year when it came time to make the payment, how were we going to get them? You know, from the time, from I, my earliest memories were of making farm payments or not having enough money or having to float an electric bill or, you know, okay, we can pay this this month, but we can't pay that. But the the big thing every year was, what do we do? How do we get the money together to make a farm payment? And then most of it was, you know, then then it was listening to my father trying to negotiate extensions with the bank and we can't just pay it all right now. And this, you know, so I had felt like by that point, you know, I had seen this movie over and over and over again. <laughs> and I was out on my own by that point. I had moved out when I was, you know, 15 the summer, um, right when I turned 16. So, and then had started my business and I was making money, right? But now I'm making money on my own. I'm able to keep that money and reinvest that money into my business. And I'm not having to hand over every single dollar to my parents. And I'm avoiding my parents as much as I can too. So I don't have to give them the money, right? So I'm thinking about getting away. So, uh, you know, at that point, it's not, you know, at the time I was 16, it's not about the farm. It's about escaping and creating a better life for myself away from the farm. So, but by the time I made the decision at 17 that I was going to take things over, it was really a matter of the circumstances. My father's uh, health was failing and he and my mother, their relationship had really unwound and, you know, things were really out of kind of out of control personally. And I knew that if I was going to step in and take over, that it wasn't going to be, you know, a situation where I was going to continue to fund something that I had watched be unsuccessful my entire life, that we were going to have to do it my way. And my way meant I was going to be the one to take over the farm. And I was going to be the one to make the decisions. And it was the only way it was going to work. I love how that, um, I love how you set that up in the book. And I'll leave it to the readers to, uh, to enjoy that. Once you've got the farm, uh, one of the turning points, of course, is that you were able to cut a production deal with, uh, with Walmart. And this yeah. has been the separate focus of a Harvard Business School study, mm -hmm. um, really negotiating 4th of July watermelon prices with Walmart. Talk about that first. I just such a great entrepreneurial story, Sarah. Sure. Talk about that first conversation with Walmart and saying, "I'm going to do this," and then your reaction, which I yes. thought was so human, after that, saying, "I can't believe what I just got myself into." Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. So I had been delivering to their stores directly, their Division One stores, before they, had, they were converted to super centers. I had been delivering fresh produce to their Division One stores, so I had a relationship with, um, you know, the store managers and and the associates that worked at the stores. And it was it was what the work I was doing for them was very seasonal. And um, I happened to be, you know, I was a one woman show back then. And I happened to be driving past a distribution center that they had built. 
and and I knew that they had were converting some of their stores to you know they were in the process of converting their stores to super centers. And so I remember driving by thinking, gosh, it would just be so much easier if I could, you know, drop all of these melons off at that DC instead of having to take them to 12 different grocery stores. Well, little did I know when I when I walked into that distribution center that day, really, I mean, I don't think that I don't think that I had a really good, clear understanding of the sheer amount of volume that they could take. And um Maybe I kind of knew, but it it hadn't really sunk in, you know. And so when I I uh, I showed up without an appointment, I walked in the door. In fact, that you know the DC wasn't even open yet technically. And you know I'm like I'm like looking around this place, <laughs> like oh this is a really nice facility, isn't this great? And I run into this guy, and I'm like hey, by the way, um, you know. I deliver melons to your stores and, you know, are you going to have a produce buying office here? Is somebody, is there someone here that I can talk to about bringing my fresh produce here to this DC? And he said, you know, as a matter of fact, we are, we're going to have a fresh produce buying office and, and the woman who's going to run that, she happens to be here today and she's setting up her office. Would you like to meet her? And I said, well, absolutely. Take me to your leader. <laughs> you know, it was, it was fantastic. And so, um, Anyway, in, in that meeting with Laura, she was, you know, she was uh, very, she was like really happy that I had walked through the door because I, I had made her life, what she, she believed that I had made her life easier because she said, wait, this is great. So you're, you're already, you know, delivering to the stores. You, you can bring the product here. That's fantastic. I need suppliers. And, um, you know, can you, can you deliver, you know, whatever it was, it was like five semi loads of watermelons a week, three semi loads of, of cantaloupes a week. And I said, sure, no problem. You know, in my head, I'm thinking this is what I do every day, right? I mean, I deliver right. fruit. And uh, so anyway, uh, you know, she shook my hand and I said, okay, we'll be in touch. And I I remember uh, having to, I had to get a Dun & Bradstreet number and like we had to get like a more official. So I think I was, I'm trying to think I, I forget the process that I was using, you know, the stores had paid me that we had to get the vendor agreement and everything set up. But as, as I was walking out of the, uh, of the building after meeting with her, like it, the, it goes off in my head. Like it, I didn't fully process the fact that she said semi loads. Now keep in mind, I'm walking out into the parking lot where my, you know, one ton Ford Dually pickup truck is parked with a with a 16 foot trailer behind it, right? <laughs> That's all I had. I didn't have a semi. And I like, I'm like, wait, she said loads, meaning semi loads. I don't own a semi truck. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, and I just committed to this. And I and there was and really there wasn't a moment where I ever thought, well, I can't do it. I knew that I would figure it out. Um so I was confident in that, but I had this, this moment, like, okay, this is not something, this is something I have to figure out very quickly. This isn't something that, you know, it's going to require help. Just a great entrepreneurial moment. And and for so many of our listeners, that's just going to be terrific. I also love the story and I'd love for you to just tell it. um, uh, You were buying from some Amish growers Mm -hmm. and, and you also had to let Walmart know that you could fill that order. Um, and Amish people don't exactly have a lot of technology. Can you tell that story? Cause it's so fun. In the book. No, they don't. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, Walmart needed a lot of volume back then. And it was like piecing together. Um, I had to piece together from a lot of different growers, all of the fruit that I needed to, you know, to, to help them meet their needs, their volume needs. And, you know, ironically, up in uh, Rockville, Indiana, there was this uh, group of Amish that had started growing pumpkins and they grew these pumpkins, but they, you know, their harvest methods obviously were very antiquated. They, you know, they were harvesting with a team of horses and pulling a, a wagon, you know, like you know, still load, which we still load pumpkins by hand, but we use, you know, buses now that go, you know, you could drive buses, you know, 60 miles an hour down the highway. They were using horses. And I remember um, just being on these crazy, crazy missions. I mean, the Amish that, you know, that was really interesting dealing with them. And in fact, we still uh, work with the Amish on some of the commodities uh, that we, that we market. But 
you know, there, my life was full of so many interesting stories of being at farms and places, you know, at, at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, you know, rounding up fruit to fill an order for, you know, a major retail, you know, a big retailer. And, um, you know, the story, one of the stories that I tell in the book was that I, I needed to use the telephone. And I was up there late one evening uh, getting loaded at this farm in the middle of these, you know, these hills and woods and it was very isolated and the children are out there, the Amish children are out there and they're the, they're the harvest crew. And I said, I, I have, you have to get me to a, I have to get to a telephone. I had a, I had a cell phone at the time. Remember the big old bag phones, right, but I had right. no service. And I said, I, I need a telephone. And the little boy points to the woods and it's like a dark, scary woods. This is like the dead <laughs> of fall in October. It's kind of cold and it's a little dreary. And I'm loading pumpkins in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with these, with this Amish family. And and I look at the woods and I like, I was like, there's a phone in there. And he and he just keeps pointing. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. all right. Well, so then I take off and I I literally I walk a little less than a quarter of a mile. I mean, it was a long way in the woods to a, a, along a path where I find a phone hanging on a tree in a wooden box. So I, well, I see the box on the tree and then I'm like kind of scared to open it. Honestly, it feels like a scene out of a bad movie. <laughs> like open the That's box. That's a great story. In the book. And there's really the phone. Is. So um, yeah, but it was, you know, things like that happen to me all the time. Like I, and you just had to like go with it. There was, you know, I think that's just part of being an entrepreneur too. I mean, you're going to, like, you just go through all of this stuff and then someday, you know, you start to look back and you, it, I have, for when I was writing the growing, growing season, I had forgotten so much. And there were so many stories that I couldn't include that were just, you know, equally, maybe even better than that. But it was just like, you know, what do you, what do you add? What do you, you know, what do you, what stories do you tell? But um, that was, that's sort of just, all part of the process, like going through crazy things and having crazy experiences. And so many entrepreneurs have these stories. And um, anyway, uh, for me, it was, I felt like something like that happened to me at least twice a day, my entire I, life. I think, I think your stories, uh, and it's so well put, Sarah, I think so much of what you're relating in the book will resonate with our entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah. They, like you, need to understand that um, perseverance, persistence, oh, and, yeah. luck, and a lot of luck play yeah. uh, play a role. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the products and sustainability and what, what you're thinking about, Sama. Why pumpkins, um, Sarah, of all the crops? <laughs> talk about pumpkins. You are described uh, recently in the New York Times as the pumpkin queen of America. Why pumpkins? So when I bought this farm, um, I had to produce something on it. It was a small farm. And normally, even when um, I took over the farm, I you had to, if you were going to grow corn or soybeans, you would need a minimum of a thousand acres to make an okay living probably more like 2000 to be able to afford the equipment. So if you're growing corn or soybeans, you need, you know, you need a, a combine, a quarter of a million dollar combine, you need a tractor, you need a disc, you need a planter, you need all of these things, you need, you know, close to $700,000 worth of, of equipment. And so for me, I had to figure out what can I grow? What this is what I have. I have this this 80 acres that I grew up on and 20 acres down the road um, where the little house was that I moved out into when I was very young. I'm thinking, what can I do with this very limited amount of acreage? So you have to learn to do more with less. And I think we all know that anybody that's been scrappy and started a business, that's the first thing you have to figure out. I mean, I have to figure out how to do more with less. And it was no different in farming. And that's why I chose pumpkins uh, to grow pumpkins. The soil was conducive to growing pumpkins. And the uh, I knew that I would have a market for the pumpkins because of uh, the grocery stores that I was already selling to. I knew that it would be an easy transition from melons into a different season. 
And then I actually thought, okay, well then after pumpkins, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do Christmas trees and I'll just, I'll be the, you know, the, the live goods holiday person. Like this will be my job, like right. working toward holiday. And so um, that's why I started to grow uh, pumpkins. And then I just had this love and this joy um, for pumpkins. And, and I, I felt joy when I saw them. So it was something that made me happy. And um, I knew that pumpkins were also a crop that made other people happy. And I thought, well, what, you know, what, what, what better crop to grow than pumpkins? So when I started growing the pumpkins, it was, it was an, like I said, it was a natural transition for my business going into another season and another commodity. But it was also something that I was very passionate about because of, of the joy that I felt like. So when I was delivering watermelons and cantaloupes, people would get excited. They'd be like, oh, those are great, you know, great smelling, great tasting watermelons. And oh, look at the watermelon truck. But when they saw the pumpkin truck, it was a different kind of joy. You know, they'd be like, oh, pumpkins. It was a different kind of excitement. And I fed off of that. And I thought, oh, the pumpkins make people happy. This is awesome. And so um, that's why, you know, that's that's why I grew the pumpkins. And that's why I have the, the love that I have for the fruit. It's like it's, it's something that makes people happy. Yeah, it's such a great entrepreneurial lesson. Um, passion for the product and product mix. Yeah. You. You do that, uh, you talk about it in the book in such an engaging and storytelling way. Um, mm -hmm. There, are So much of what you're doing with Fray Farms going is, is thinking about what happens going forward. And I know one of the things that got you excited was this concept that you saw about uh, around sustainability. So growing up on a farm, you saw lots and lots of waste and decided um, that there were these ugly overlooked products that mm -hmm. could be turned into something. Right. Talk about that. And for so many of our entrepreneurs who might say, well, this piece of what I'm doing is just junk. It's waste. Mm -hmm. You didn't do that. Then you turned it into a new product line. Yeah. yeah. What I really did was um, I really sort of, and I t sort of tell the story. So when you read the book and you're going through the memoir and it takes you through the early years of my life on this really small farm that's very scrappy and we're hunting we're gathering or we're killing or having to kill our food you know that you get the sense that nothing is going to waste because nothing's going to waste we're using everything we're picking wild blackberries you know in the summer getting you know full of chiggers we're you know raising a truck patch we're canning tomatoes you know we're 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 putting our food up for the winter and storing it in the cellar and and or or we're hunting for our food so as a child and um growing up and through through my teen years there was this waste not want not because that was a way of life nothing food was simple it was clean and it was delicious and nothing ever went to waste then when i started my business and i started growing my business and i was looking at it the industry and then and not just the industry but also my own growing business i couldn't shake that feeling that i had from when i was a child because we couldn't waste anything right you know and so i'm looking around at the end of a harvest and i'm seeing all of this fruit that was visually Im imperfect um but i knew that it still tasted good and it still had a, could have a purpose and it bothered me personally because of the way that I was raised, you know, and um, to see it, food go to waste was an, an issue for me. So I started thinking about not just from a financial standpoint, um, but also from sort of a, a, a personal a, a value, a core value standpoint, like I can't handle watching that happen. And you know, what if, you know, how do, what, how do we find this fruit's greater purpose? How do we turn it into something more? And um, that's why we started making the Sama watermelon juice. So we would have, you know, at the end of a heart, we would harvest millions of these watermelons. We'd have hundreds of thousands of watermelons 
that might be visually imperfect. Maybe they're misshapen or, you know, they have a, you know, a, 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 maybe they're, you know, sun-kissed, which, which is a nice way of saying the melon got a little sunburnt. Right. Um, yeah. But the fruit is still good to eat. So, you know, we decided to start taking that imperfect fruit. No one was making watermelon juice at the time. So we started juicing the melons on the farm. And that's when we, and that's when we uh, started the brand Sama Watermelon Juice. And, uh, and it's, it has the funky name Sama because it's, it, I'm a farmer geek and we named the product after the mother of all watermelons. So right. all watermelon um, seeds originated from uh, the ancient Sama melon, which still grows wild in the Kalahari desert today. And it was a source of hydration. So for thousands of years, people used this melon to travel in the, in the desert. Like no one would travel unless it was Sama season. And I thought that story was so cool and it resonated with me. And I thought, well, we have all of this innovation now around this, the seed varieties that we grow, but really the, you know, we want to pay homage to the mother of all watermelons, which is the Sama watermelon, which sustains life and, you know, hydrated ancient civilizations for thousands of years. So we started making that juice out of the visually imperfect fruit. Now, granted, it was it's delicious. I mean, we cut every watermelon open by hand to make sure that the inside is perfect. Um, but it doesn't matter what's on the outside. It's like with people. I mean, it, it's it's what's on the inside that counts. And we started making uh, we started making the juice. Then that led us to look at other things in our business and figure out ways that we can you know, utilize more of what we're growing. And the same thing with pumpkins. I mean, most Americans don't know that you know, over 50% of our fresh produce in the United States is actually imported. And many of the fruits and vegetables that we buy, even if we're shopping at, a, at an, or, you know, super fancy supermarket and we're buying organic frozen, you know, fruits or vegetables, most people don't realize that a lot of those products come from China. You're buying frozen fruits and vegetables and they're actually imported from China. And no one has to tell you that because of the country of origin labeling. Um, it, you don't have to put so I in the fresh industry like if I sell a watermelon to a retailer I have to say produce of USA or produce of Mexico or produce of wherever but once food has went through a process they don't uh, manufacturers don't have to tell you where the fruit has come from so anyway we started thinking about you know okay what other commodities can we do and then I and then I found out and as, as the nation's largest producer of fresh pumpkins I'm like well, let's, let's let maybe let's do some pumpkin seeds. And then I find out that the majority of all pumpkin seeds come from China. And I'm like, this is terrible. Like, what, why? What, like, okay, we have to figure this out. I mean, I, how, how do we do this and be competitive in, in a global market? Like, what, what's, why hasn't someone done this already, you know? So then we started doing, you know, taking the pumpkins, doing seed extraction, and then also the all of the leftover pumpkins, you know, so some fields actually need the pumpkin to go back, the organic matter put back in the soil. But then we started making pumpkin powder, pumpkin flour, and all of these different things out, out of the pumpkins that we were growing. And then we looked at every individual crop that we were growing. And you know that's the question that we ask, how do we find the fruit's higher purpose? The visually imperfect or otherwise known as ugly fruit, how do we find the, the greater purpose? And then how do we help other growers do the same? you know, other family farms, because it's also the right thing to do for the farm, because when you're selling low margin commodities, you have to, th you have to use all that you grow. So it's the right thing for the farm. It's the right thing for the consumer and it's the right thing for the planet. And then at the end of the day, it also makes me feel better because the, yeah, less, the a, less we waste, the better oh, I it's, feel. It's a, it's a terrific rounding out of the story. Um, and Sarah, I want to um, I want to sort of end with a bit of advice for our entrepreneurs because um, you're talking about sustainability um, and making sure that you're doing the right thing for the business. But um, there are so many stories in uh, in the book where you make an active effort to make sure that people understand their contribution to the greater whole. And in particular, um, you're telling from the beginning. Uh, women entrepreneurs, that you can do this, you need to do this, there need to be more of us. In fact, your dedication um, is uh, to the girls who steal thunder and the boys who help them do it. Yeah. And I know you're thinking about this with your with your two sons as well. 
talk to our women entrepreneurs, talk to our under historically underrepresented entrepreneurs, and tell them what they ought to be thinking about as they launch the, a business. Well, I think that, you know, ultimately, if you, uh, I, I use this term, it's, it's sort of harsh, actually, but I'm just going to go ahead. You, whatever you do, you have to literally want it more than you want to breathe. And, and I know that that sounds a little excessive and it doesn't play into the whole work-life balance <laughs> theme. <laughs> um, but you, you really do. You, I mean, you have to really want it that bad and it has to be your focus and you, you can ultimately do anything. And I, I think I didn't, I get asked a lot about being a woman in a very male dominated industry, but if I'm just being completely candid, I, I never thought about my gender. When I was a young girl, it's not like I didn't encounter uh, people who underestimated me or, you know, maybe didn't want to give me a chance or whatever because of my gender. I just didn't pay attention to a lot of that. And I just stayed focused on what I wanted to accomplish. And I never really felt like if someone was standing in my way and I didn't really let it get in my head, I, I figured out how to go around under over whatever. And I, I just, I just really didn't give the fact that I was a girl a whole lot of thought when I was doing what I was doing. Now, maybe some of that was because I was raised by boys and I had been doing, you know, the things, the same things that the boys did for most of my life. Um, but I think sometimes we let later in life than in my, in my mid twenties, I remember thinking, Oh, I have to wear a pantsuit. So I'm taken seriously. Right. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to wear a pantsuit to this business meeting. Nobody told me I had to wear a pantsuit that caught in my own head. Right. Like it, it, it I let that sort of get in my own head that, well, maybe people aren't going to take me seriously if I wear a, you know, a skirt and heels and a blouse, like I need to wear a pantsuit. No one told me that I had to do that. Somehow that got in my own head. So I think my advice would, would be, you know, just stay focused on the mission. If you want it more than you want to breathe, it doesn't matter. Like nothing is going to get in your, in your way. Gender, you know, uh, gender inequality, none of those things will get in your way as long as you are solely focused. And I think the world has changed so much too. People are, are more mindful and um, more aware of diversity and the value of diversity. And it's been really exciting for me to see you know, the world changed just in my short time in business and, and how diversity is valued and how, um, you know, women's voices and their opinions are valued and more women ha are getting seats at the table and it does matter. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the fact that especially, especially, you know, retail companies realize, hey, women are the ones that spend the money in, in our stores, you know, women are the, are the, are the ones that actually buy our products and, and they're spending the household dollars. So why wouldn't we want women, you know, in, in these positions, helping to make these decisions about our company or our brands or these things? For me, in my entire life, it, it is, it's just made good sense to hire women. People say, well, do you hire a lot of women? I don't hire women because they're women. I hire women because they happen to be the right people for the job. And I sometimes find out that, you know, I mean, their insight is what I need, you know, for a particular position or whatever. They just maybe do the job better. But it's not like I go out and say, well, I have a quota of X number of females or X number of minorities that I want to hire. It just so happens to be that, you know, the best people for the job happen to be women um, more often than not. Wonderful. Sarah, thank you so much. The book is The Growing Season, How I Saved an American Farm and Built a New Life. I can't recommend this enough. It's a compelling personal story and memoir from an extraordinary entrepreneur. Sarah Fry, thank you for being with us, and I hope everyone will get this book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on. Take care and have a great day.